Hi friends, I welcome you all on this session of constipation. Constipation does not have a definitive definition. It does not depend on the character of stool, the ease of evacuation or the frequency of stool. But we can say that the bowel frequency once in every three days can be named as constipation. We can classify constipation in megacolon and non-megacolon disease. In megacolon disease, we can again classify into Hirschsprung's disease and non-Hirschsprung's megacolon or megarectum. And in non-megacolon, we can classify as slow transit or normal transit. Now we'll come to Hirschsprung's disease. This is a very, very favorite topic and many questions are always sprinkled on this topic. Now we'll see it in details. The pathology of Hirschsprung's disease the major feature is absence of ganglionic cell in the neural plexus of the intestinal wall. There is always hypertrophy of the nerve trunks. In this disease, there is failure of migration of neuroblast into the gut from vagal nerve trunks at the end of the first trimester of fetal life. The loss of ganglion cell extends for a variable distance above the anorectal junction. Variable portion of intestine is involved. In two-thirds of patients, the rectum and lower sigmoid colon are involved. The severity of symptoms may not depend on the length of the affected segment and may be related to the number of acetylcholinesterase positive nerve fibers. Disease may be familiar or associated with Down syndrome or other genetic disorders. Gene mutations have been identified on chromosome 10 and on chromosome 13 in some patients. The absence of ganglion cells give rise to a contracted non-peristaltic segment with a dilated hypertrophic segment of the normal colon above it. Did you get what I said just now? I will just explain it to you. This is a normal colon. This is a dilated part of the colon. But the disease part is this part, which is a ganglionic segment, which is contractile, non-peristaltic. And the segment above it will become dilated, hypertrophic. And that's why it is just different from achalasia cardia. So always remember that it is not same like achalasia cardia, but it, in Hirschsprung's, there is this segment which is abnormal and not containing ganglionic cell, whereas a dilated segment contains the ganglionic cells, which are normal in number. Clinical features. It is 1 in 5,000 live births. There is familial tendency. More common in males than in females. Clinical picture varies from acute intestinal obstruction in neonates to chronic constipation in later life. The classic picture is gross abdominal distension, chronic constipation and failure to thrive. Now I have divided it into three classes. First is neonates. They will present where with delayed passage of meuconium for more than 48 hours, mild abdominal distension and if complicated by enterocolitis, then might present with perforation and septicemia. If it is with enterocolitis, there is high mortality. Second will have in first few weeks of life, if the patient presents, it will be with chronic constipation. And third, in otherwise healthy children and adults, severe constipation without soiling, that's how the patient will present and they will have short segment of Hirschsprung's disease. The stool when passed may consist of small pellets or ribbon-like, but large stools are absent. Now, how do we diagnose this patient? We should always go for rectal biopsy. In children, suction rectal biopsy is used, while as in adults, a formal strip full thickness rectal biopsy is taken. Specimen is taken from just above the anorectal junction. Biopsy should include a representative area of at least one nerve plexus. Demonstration of ergangliosis 
and hypertrophic nerve fibers in the nerve plexus will confirm the diagnosis. Second diagnostic tool will be anorectal manometry, which is done in young child or adult who is otherwise fit. The rectospentric inhibitory reflex is absent. Other radiological diagnostic features will be on erect and supine abdominal radiographs, there will be air fluid levels showing obstruction or intramural gas which will show enterocolitis and if there is free peritoneal gas, a perforation is diagnosed. An enema using water soluble contrast medium that is barium enema will confirm the diagnosis and indicate the length and the site of involved intestine. A rectal examination should not be performed before radiology because it may dilate the abdo uh, abnormal segment because it may dilate the abnormal segment and modify the radiological features. The coning down of the transition zone, irregularity in the mucosa and the abnormal contraction of the intestine are the important positive findings on this x-ray. Treatment, it depends on the age of the patient, the length of the involved segment, the severity of the symptoms and the presence of enterocolitis. Treatment usually includes first is rehydration, second is systemic antibiotics, third is nasogastric decompression that is putting a Ryle's tube in the stomach and decompressing the stomach and fourth is very important and that is bowel irrigation. If the patient that is a neonate or a child or an adult does not respond to this therapy, then you should think about a surgery. Surgery that is defunctioning colostomy or defunctioning stoma should be created. When this stoma is created, it is very important to remember that it should be done in the ganglionic segment and you should not cut the same ganglionic segment and get it out as a stoma. So what is important is take a ganglionic segment, take it out and create a stoma. And how can you be sure that it is ganglionic? You can do it frozen section on the OT table that is operation theater. In the operation theater, may take a frozen section, send it for the pathology and see whether the ganglions are present or absent. You can be sure that the stoma created has ganglion in it and then go for the surgery. The surgery consists of multiple stage procedure. This includes a colostomy in a newborn period followed by definitive pull through operation. Operation is always done after the child is weighed over 8 to 10 kilograms and is thriving. There are three options for the definitive pull through procedures. The options are always major procedures and that's why you should be 100% sure that the patient is above 10 kilos and is thriving. For all three operations, the principle of treatment remains same and it is just confirm the location that is the transition zone between ganglionic and ganglionic segment, resect the ganglionic segment to do the anastomosis from the normal colon to the rectum or to the anus. These three steps remain same only there are different procedures and these three different procedures are the Duhamel's procedure, Svensson's procedure and Sov's procedure. In the Duhamel's procedure, keep the rectum in place and bring ganglionic bobble into the recto-rectal space. In the Svensson's procedure, a resection with end-to-end -end anastomosis is performed by exteriorizing the bobbel ends through the anus and in Sov's procedure, it is performed by endorectal dissection, removing the mucosa from the ganglionic distal segment, bringing the ganglionic segment down to anus within the seromuscular tunnel. Other procedures are colo-anal anastomosis, which is reserved for older children, teenagers or adult, where after resecting the ganglionic segment, you can do the anastomosis of the normal colon directly to the anus. The rectum is mobilized and transected just above the level of the pelvic floor. 
The normal colon is then joined to the top of anal canal either directly with the stippling technique or by sleeve technique following the mucosectomy of the upper anal canal and rectum. Restorative proctocolectomy can be done in few patients. In the cases of Hirschsprung's disease involving the entire colon, it is possible to reconstruct with ileo anal pouch procedure. The main post-operative complications include enterocolitis, constipation and anastomotic stricture. Now we have covered Hirschsprung's disease but as the classification, now we will go on to non-Hirschsprung's megacolon or megarectum. Now in this, it is non-Hirschsprung's that means that a ganglionic segment is not exactly as it is described in the Hirschsprung's disease. It is a rare condition and the cause is not known. Poor toilet training during infancy or congenital abnormality of the intestinal myenteric plexus is seen. On per rectal examination, hard fecal mass of the feces is felt. The anus is usually patulous, perianal soiling is common. Radiology X-ray abdomen will show small quantity of water soluble contrast, there is enlarged rectum and distension of colon over a variable length. The width of the colon at the pelvic brim more than 6.5 cm will diagnose the case of idiopathic megarectum and megacolon. Anorectal physiological test. In this large volume inflated in the rectum to induce a feeling of rectal fullness. So it will be more than the normal volume which is inflated. Even the inhibition of internal and external anal sphincters at much larger volume than normal will be seen. Full thickness rectal biopsy will show normal ganglionic cell in which it will be distinguishing feature from the Hirschsprung's to this megarectum disease. Medical treatment is directed at emptying the rectum and keeping it empty with enemas or washouts. Sometimes manual evacuation is done under anesthesia and after this patient is encouraged to develop a regular daily bowel habits with the use of laxatives and repeated enemas as necessary. Surgical treatment is only when the medical treatment fails. Resection of dilated rectum and colon is done and normal ganglionic cells will confirm the at frozen section and then the, it is reconstructed with condo anal anastomosis. Now we'll come to non-megacolon constipation. In this, if you remember, I have al already classified into a slow transit and a normal transit. In normal transit, then why it will be obstructed? It will be because there will be obstructed defecation. So first we will see if there is slow transit, how the patient will present. It will be called as non-megacolon constipation. Patients have abdominal pain, distension, relies on laxatives and have difficulty with defecation. He is otherwise healthy, seeks help for constipation, eats normal diet and have normal colon on endoscopy and barium minima and on barium enema. Whole gut transit time is measured. How to measure this? Stop all laxatives and take a capsule containing radiopic marker. Retention of this capsule for more than 80% with the shape of the capsule for more than 120 hours after ingestion is abnormal and then you can call it a slow transit. You can also do defecating proctography. Idiopathic slow transit constipation usually seen in women because of infrequent bowel actions may be since childhood or suddenly follows abdominal or pelvic surgeries. Delayed transit is seen by using marker studies. It is may or may not be able to empty the rectum normally. Medical treatment difficult condition to treat medically. Dietary measures are of no use. Surgical treatment is needed only when careful studies are done and when medical treatment fails. Total colectomy and ileo-rectal anastomosis is preferred procedure but results 
are unpredictable. One third of patients continues to have diarrhea or constipation and two third have persistent abdominal pain. It is essential to exclude underlying psychiatric or psychological problem. Now we'll come to obstructed defecation that is normal transit time but the defecation is obstructed. The patient complains of extreme difficulty in expelling stool, may have repeated attempts at rectal evacuation. Common feature is weakness of the pelvic floor which descends down on straining. Patient may resort to digital evacuation or pressure on the perineum. Cause is not known, may arise from damage to pelvic nerves caused by prolonged straining at stool or during childbirth. Defecation proctography will show abnormal evacuation. There may be intussusception with the upper rectum folding in the roll rectum or an anterior rectocele. Biofeedback training is necessary. Dietary therapy and laxatives are usually unsuccessful. Surgery should be last resort. Defunctioning ileostomy or a colostomy with colostomy irrigation is used in intractable cases. Now we have come to the end of the constipation. At this juncture, I feel that this was a very confusing topic for all the medical students. I have tried to make it easy, dividing it into Hersprung's, non-Hersprung, then slow transit and then obstructed defecation. Now the questions which are asked are confusing like in which patient you will get soiling of feces. So you have to just go through only these four topics and then decide which topic had soiling of feces. Or the question might be asked that which uh, in which colon or in which megacolon you get the patient with digital evacuation of the rectum. Then again, I have made it quite easy for you all to remember that in which patient, like in obstructed megacolon, you have to do digital evacuation of the rectum. I am very sure that you must have understood this constipation and your concept must be made very clear after I have divided the constipation into these four headings.